let's talk about Power Apps performance, right? So I get questions all the time. Some of them are very much like, hey, how do I make this thing faster? And other ones are like, I have this weird problem that turns out the problem is performance. So what I did was I took five of those questions that I've gotten, and we're just gonna turn those into some different talking points, little quick demos, things to help you guys understand the common mistakes and common conversations I'm having. Sound fun? Then let's just switch over to my desktop and take a look. Okay, so the first one I wanna talk through is don't race, right? And so race conditions is where you expect things to get done in a specific order, and because you haven't actually set them to wait on each other, they don't necessarily always get done. And so when the one you expected to win wins the race, then great performance, everything works well. But when the second one finishes before the first one, your app gets really wonky, right? Like this is one of those questions I get a lot of times like, hey, this thing only doesn't work for Judy. And it turns out it just happens that Judy's computer, the second one always wins the race, even though you didn't realize they were racing. So let's do a demo of kind of what I mean here. So what I've done is I've built what I call the slow flow, right? So if we go over here, Power Automate, and we look, I have this flow called the slow flow. We'll edit it real quick. All this flow does is it gets triggered by Power Apps. We take an input of how many seconds to wait, and then we do a delay action, right? So that way, I call this the slow flow. It gives me a chance when I want to demo things that need to take time, and I just want to make it wait X amount of time, I often use this flow. If we take that flow and put it here in this button, you're going to see that I've got update context. So create me a variable called var flow start and set it to now and do long time. So that way we can see the seconds. So right assuming the hour, minute, and seconds of when things happen. Then we're going to run this flow that takes 30 seconds, right? And we know it's going to take 30 seconds. We're going to pass it at 30. And then we know that the, uh, the delay timer will be 30 seconds, right? So that flow will take 30, 31 seconds to complete. And then if we do update context here at the end, we're going to create a second variable and we're going to grab the same now. And so that should be roughly 30, 31 seconds apart, right? So that's what we're gonna to do to test this idea. So we'll do this, we'll hold down the Alt key, we'll press the button, and we're gonna see that it took only one second. What happened? Well, if we go look over at flows, look at my slow flow here, my slow flow is still running. So the flow didn't finish, but that's okay in this scenario because what happens here, right? So if you think about it, you know that Power Apps run sequentially, right? So this ran, boom, set the variable. This ran, what is completion for this command though? Completion for this command is I sent it to flow. I said, flow, do this, right? Nothing about that says, hey, I need to wait on flow to respond. And so then we do this third one and we grab that timestamp again. And so that's why there's only taking about a second here because it's only taken one second-ish for Power Apps to say, hey, flow, start. And flow to say, okay, I started, right? Like that's the whole conversation. So this is one I've seen people get in a lot of trouble with. Like one guy, uh, he was using this flow to update SQL server. So he was sending a bunch of stuff to flow and have it do SQL store procedures, that type of stuff. And then immediately in his power app, he was counting on that store procedure being done. And so sometimes because the store procedure was fast, it would be done in time, right? So he was racing, basically. He didn't realize it, but he was racing in his logic. But the times that the store procedure didn't finish updating before he refreshed his data over here in Power Apps, he was getting really confusing results, okay? So this is a great example of a race. So Shane, I wanna do exactly what he was doing, but I don't want to have the problem. Great. Then what you need to do is you need to make a slow flow with respond. So if we go here and edit, and obviously you're not building slow flows for your production, but what you wanna do, right, is you're just where I have the delay, you're thinking about, all right, that's where my logic is. My logic roughly takes that many seconds, so I can make sure that everything works well when it takes that long, or when it takes twice as long as it's supposed to. Okay, so here's this slow flow response. So the only difference, right, that's the same, seconds of delay, that's the same. Down here at the bottom, I add a respond to Power Apps, okay? Notice that there's no output. I'm not even sending anything back to Power Apps. But the difference in these scenarios is that when you do this, then Power App says, oh, the flow is supposed to respond to me. I don't know what to do with the response, but that's okay. And it will wait to finish. So now if we go over here, if we take this slow flow, we're gonna change this from slow flow to slow flow with respond, and we'll just have it take 10 seconds because I don't wanna wait that long, right? But we're gonna have it take 10, okay? Now if I press this button, hold down the Alt key, and 10 or 11 seconds later, look, 909.43 was the start time, 909.54, was the end time. So it took 10 seconds. So the key here is if Power Apps depends on things to be finished, especially like when you run flows, 
then you wanna make it respond. Or if you have other things that you're doing, right? Just always be thinking about that. Are you creating races inside your app? Are you expecting one thing to get done with the other without the other getting done without actually telling it to wait, right? Because that first one I showed you, you've been like, oh yeah, well, of course it set the variable and then ran the flow. And then when the flow was done, it set the thing. But no, that's not actually how it works. And so things like this kind of help us visualize that. But racing is a problem here. Racing can be a problem over here as well, right? Like, so this is just a regular form and you know, guys, you do submit form. And so here, a lot of times I see you put code after a submit form. Remember, submit form says, hey, form, be submitted. The form says, cool, I've been submitted. Like, it's not counting on all the things. It's not counting on whether or not it's successful or not. So one of the things that I teach in my classes is we never ever put code after submit form. If you want something to happen after a form finishes submitting, what do you do? You go click on your form and then you go down here and you use on success. And this is where you would put that code. Same thing if you need to have it do something, if it fails, you put it here. Don't ever write logic after submit form. That should always be the last thing on a button. Everything that happens after the form is submitted comes either from on, familiar, on failure, on success, on reset here. Okay, so that's the racing problem. All right, next up is the n plus one problem. Okay, this is another very common mistake people make that they have no idea they're making mistakes. So over here we have my lovely employees table like we always have, right? I've got their name, their department, and now I want to show their department manager. And we know that over my department list, we have the department manager, right? So for executive, it should find out that that's executive Ella. So what do people tend to do? They go right here and they say department manager and they throw an ampersand and they say look up from departments where title equals this item dot department, right? They do that, they do that, and then they do a, a period there and they say show me the, uh, I think it's manager name, it's just manager, and there you go, that pulls in, okay? So they're like, yay, I got what I want, why do I care? This is what we call the N plus one problem. So if we were to go look at monitor, we would see that in order to render this gallery, Right, what happens? It is one call to our SharePoint list. It says, hey, give me the first 100 records from your employees list. Whoop, there they are. We've only got like 20 something, easy beasy, lemon squeezy. Then though you said, hey, and every one of these labels that render, right? So now I gotta label, render this label 20 times. I need you to go look up against my data source and pull this information in. So if I had 20 different departments, I'm gonna have to do this query 20 different times. And so now instead of my gallery being rendered in one network call, it's rendered in 21 network calls. You see where that causes problems, right? My small data set, who cared, right? I only got 20 records, no big deal. But when you have hundreds or thousands of items, this can cause a lot of performance problems, okay? Now, under the hood, Microsoft does some things to make this smarter so it's not as terrible as it used to be, but I don't want you doing this, right? You should not be doing lookups inside of your galleries. Same thing if you have a gallery, you're doing a bunch of complex calculations or you're doing a bunch of you know, data manipulation. Remember that everything that happens inside this gallery row, if it is specific to that item, it is happening once for every item in there. And if you've got thousands of items, well, it only loads in chunks of 100, but you're asking 100 things to fire at once and that can cause a lot of grief, right? So try to avoid this. Ways that we can avoid this, well, if maybe in this case, departments is just a small table, we could have put that into a collection and then we could have looked up against the collection. That had been really fast and would not have called a bunch of network calls. That'd be a good idea. You could make it so the only way they see department manager is by clicking on the record and then showing all the details over here on the right, right? So instead of having this gallery over here, but have a detail so they can find a call or they can find any data that is in the primary table. But if they want to see something that is in a child table, then we're going to say, hey, let's click on the record, right? We click on the little arrow, and then over here on the right, we would show all the details. We could do all the advanced calculations, we'd do the lookups, because we're only doing it for one record, just the record they clicked on, instead of doing it the display, which would do all of them. The N plus one problem is a problem that pro devs have been dealing with forever. Us low code devs, it turns out though, we can have uh, N plus one problems because we just, you know, we didn't even think about the whole idea that galleries do that. Now, I will give Microsoft kudos. It does a lot to help you avoid stubbing your toe here, but I'd rather you understand what's going on and you write logic to take care of not stubbing your toe instead of counting on their built-in logic. All right, so the next problem, we're gonna dive in and let's talk a little bit about how SharePoint's gotten too big for its britches sometimes. Just a reminder, most of these questions come from my training students, right? So once a month, we have a, what we call office hours where they can all join, they ask their questions, and I answer all those, right? I answer 
hundreds of questions every month, right? We have two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon to kind of handle different time zones. But people join, they submit their questions, we talk through those. And so some of these questions are coming straight out of those office hours. Uh, there's also some of the other ones that come into our little training help that we kind of take. So just remember, if you want to be able to ask me your questions and get me, my input on your problems, you know, we have mentoring services. We also then have, if you sign up for training at training.powerapps91.com, you can join one of those office hours while you're enrolled and submit your questions. All right, back over the demo. Okay, so SharePoint, right, like, so I get this question. I got this question last week twice, two different ways. So basically someone said, hey, uh, what do I do when I want to work with sh large SharePoint lists, right? Like I've got these giant SharePoint lists. I need tips and tricks to make those run better. And the follow-up question I got from someone different, but the next day, weirdly enough, was like, hey, I've got uh, this app that's running on SharePoint. I'm having all these delegation and performance problems. Wouldn't it just be better to switch to Dataverse? I have access to that. Okay. So those were actually very similar questions uh, without those two people realizing it. So the first thing I would say is, hey, if you're working with SharePoint, right, and we know that an overwhelming majority of apps were, are on SharePoint, so it's not unusual, but SharePoint has its challenges as the SharePoint list gets too big. Not SharePoint itself, but SharePoint is a data source for Power Apps, right? Microsoft says SharePoint can hold terabytes of data. I don't know about all that, but they, they say that, right? But we know that when you're using SharePoint to back your Power Apps, then in reality, we're finding that, you know, you get just a few, uh, more than a few thousand records in there. It's going to start to have problems. And it's going to kind of depend on your scenario. So like if you're saying, hey, I'm using SharePoint just to store data. Basically, people are coming in, they're submitting inspections, and we're just shoving them in SharePoint. Shove, 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 shove. And we're never really editing, revisiting those. We're just kind of collecting info. SharePoint can handle that, no problem. But if you say, hey, we want to create all those inspections, shove, 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 shove. But now I want to be able to open those back up, edit those inspections, augment those, copy those, and start to use those transactionally, then that's where you're going to start to see problems. You know, if we're doing it for hundreds of items, great. Single digit, thousands, yeah, probably okay. You start to, you know, you get to 10,000 and 20,000, 30,000, it just gets slow, okay? It's just a fact. I, I don't like have a technical explanation why SharePoint gets so much slower in those scenarios. I just know it does. So what are things that we can do if we need to stay on SharePoint? So probably the biggest one is we need to think about archiving. I can't tell you how often we look at these type of projects and they're like, hey, yeah, my SharePoint list has got 10,000 items. It's every inspection we've done for the last 100 years. Well, are you really transacting on those all the time? Well, no, really, it's only the ones of the last 30 days that we're editing, updating, that type of stuff. Aha, right? So then what do we do? We say, let's archive. Let's take the other 99 and a half years worth, whoop, put those into a different SharePoint list that will be slow, but the ones that are hot button issues, right, the current, let's get that list as small as possible. And so we can just do that with a writing a Power Automate flow that you know does archiving, right? And then I'll put a link down in the description to a video that if you've never done archiving, but that archiving will greatly enhance your performance. So if you have SharePoint as a data source and you have lots of records in there, but you're not using all those records all the time, find a way to send some of those to a different place. You can even have that second list added to your app so there could be a special screen for working with archive stuff. No one's ever gonna use it, but if you feel bad about excluding those, then you definitely can. So archiving is the number one advice when it comes to using SharePoint as a data source. Number two is complex columns, right? So we know that like if you use text, date, numbers, those yes, no, those type of columns are very simple, right? They're straightforward. We know when we interact with them in our Power App, we get that data back without a lot of challenge. If you start using choice columns, lookup columns, calculated columns, you know, maybe not calculated columns, I don't even know where they fit in the math, but, but if you start using those columns that do more, that are harder for you to work with, like when you're patching or when you're using them in a gallery, right? Those are harder to filter on. We want to try to avoid as many of those as possible because the more complex your SharePoint data is, the less things that you can do with it over in Power Apps, the more performance challenges you're gonna have, the less things that'll be delegable, right? So all of these kind of play together. So if you're just using SharePoint to store data for your Power App, right? Basically as a database, eh, we won't get into that hot button issue, but that's okay. Try to simplify your data model in SharePoint as best as possible, and that's going to get you the best results. Third issue I run into with SharePoint is we end up with too many columns. We end up with really wide lists, right? Those bigger, wider lists, also more moving parts, more complexity, tend to slow down a lot faster than small lists because of the data load, right? If you have to get 100 uh, items back and the list is this wide, you're getting 100 this wide, right? My hands are probably outside the screen. 
But if you do it for smaller, more narrow, you're, the data load, the amount of data that you're sending across the wire is lower. So one of the things that we do over here is we've got this app, right? The Create the New Chore Report. So in this particular app, you know, we originally had a data model like this, one really wide list, Meh, right? Yes, it worked, but every time that we updated this, we had to come back to SharePoint, add the column, and then have someone come in here and edit my fields and then update my patch, okay? Like, this is a very common scenario. What we did, though, was we did what we call a better data model, right? Probably has a fancier name, but we went to a parent child. So who did it and when they did it? This is parent data. And then all of these questions, you notice that they're in a gallery? So what we're doing is we're feeding a, we have a list that just has all the questions, and then we're storing the data um, that comes from the answers in its own list, and we're kind of marrying that all back up together. So we've got a bunch of tiny lists that are making up the solution. It's faster, it's more flexible, it scales easier. If someone adds a new question to the question list, it just magically shows up here. So go check this video out if you haven't seen it before, but getting SharePoint to a better data model is something you can do that will help you get better performance if you're trying to do really wide lists. All right, and then last but not least, right, Consider changing data sources. I, I don't get paid to say this, but Dataverse and SQL Server, yes, they cause you to have to use premium licensing, but the reason they're premium is because they are premium, right? They are faster and more flexible. They've got more delegable uh, column types. Everything about your app is going to run better if you move to Dataverse or SQL Server as your backend. Yes, you have to bite the licensing bullet, but you know if you're at the point where you're doing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions through this thing a year, probably about time you did that and take advantage of some of the scale options there. So I'm not gonna give you the rant there, but just so you know, right, like that is one of the legit answers to this question is Dataverse. Okay, next, don't overstart, right? So do you ever have an app that takes too long to load, right? Like when you click on the app, it takes 30 seconds for your app to render a screen so the user can use it. The reason for that typically is because you're putting a whole bunch of code going up here to app, and you're going to the on start and you're putting, you know, lots of collections and calculations and a bunch of stuff here because everything that happens in on start has to happen before they show you the first screen. So that's why your users are waiting so long. So try to find ways to make this better, right? Like if you're creating a bunch of collections, can you do that concurrently, right? Use the concurrent function. Or are you pulling in a bunch of stuff that will be static? Remember that Microsoft now gives us this thing called formulas. And so formulas you can put in here to create collections, and then Microsoft worries about when to render, when to calculate those and to maintain those, and you're not setting those ever. It's like they're static collections in your app, static variables. So this is another tool because this will not hold up the starting of your app either. Um, or you might just say, you know what? Hey, I just really want uh, this to happen when this first screen loads or after the first screen loads. Then remember, you can use on your on visible for your screen. On visible doesn't run until your screen has rendered, become visible, but then that way they would get into the app before all your calculations would do. Um, I don't really like on visible. I think that's one of those fields that a lot of people don't know about, so it doesn't often get checked when we're troubleshooting, but that is a valid answer to this question. The last one is, you know, kind of related, but Offline, right? So I talk to people that build offline apps. We know that part of building offline apps is creating all those collections on start, loading those, all of that, right? And then they want to be able to take a bunch of stuff, collect data offline, and come back online, right? The problem that I see with a lot of people's offline, you know, designs is they want to take the whole database offline, right? Like that whole SharePoint list with 10,000 records, which is never going to work. But they're trying to take too much offline. When I design and build offline apps, I always try to force the customer to like, hey, let's take this offline on purpose. Like, let's have a big button here that says start offline, right? And so when they're in the app, they press that, and then they can step away from the internet. Secondly, when we do go to offline, I only grab the records that they're going to need. So if they're just doing an inspection for customer XYZ, we just grab customers XYZ's inspection and do it, right? Like I'm not trying to take the entire inspections database with me. This is the number one challenge that we see with offline apps is people trying to take too much data and then all the performance problems that come with that. So if you're going to do offline, which kind of falls in the same bucket, try to get the data set as small as possible because that's going to end up giving you the best results, the best performance, less chance of corruption, yada, 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 yada. Last but not least, we've got bulk operations. So this is one that I'm very guilty of, you know, but 
So Power Apps has a function called for all, right? It lets us just loop through a bunch of data and then do something like patch, right? So my offline app, they did inspected 30 items. I'd come in and say for all those 30 items. So one at a time, take that and write that off to the data source. So it'd have to do 30 writes to the network. I counted the network being there. It, it's not ideal, okay? So try to think about, can you do bulk operations other ways? So I'll put a link down below to this app, Performance Testing SharePoint. And so this one, I talk about the difference between using for all versus patch versus collect. So different bulk ways to write to your data source, whether it's SharePoint, SQL, Dataverse, any of your type of data sources, and show you using the monitor tool, which ones are the fastest, which ones are the worst. Here's a hint, for all is terrible. Though I love for all, it's very sad for me. But keep that in mind, there's a lot to be said there. Also, when you're thinking about this type of stuff, um, could you do the work somewhere else? So another thing that I'm really guilty of is I'm like, hey, I know how to do all these bulk updates in Power Apps. I'm going to do them in Power Apps. A lot of times bulk activity, bulk transactions, Flow is really good at that. So what I've been much better off to do is say, hey, Power Apps, figure out all the records that need to be updated or figure out the criteria, right? Figure out the hard part. Send that to Flow and then let Flow do all the spinning, right? Because Flow can go and run in the background without the user having to sit and wait on my Power App to spin. So trying to get more work pushed off to Power Automate Flow when it's processing lots of information, doing lots of updates, calculations, that type of stuff. I don't do that enough. I wish, wish I would because I think that that, or I don't think, I know that is the better answer. It's the same way like we talk about delegation, right? We want the filtering to happen on the SharePoint server instead of in my Power App. I want these weird transactions that I'm trying to do to happen in Power Automate Flow instead of the Power App, even though I prefer to write in Power Apps because I'm really good at Power Apps. Don't let that be a crutch, right? The whole, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. For me, Power Apps is my hammer, so everything looks like a Power Apps problem. Probably should be doing more with Power Automate. Okay, so there you go. So there are a bunch of different uh, performance things that kind of come across my desk in the last month. I just thought they'd be helpful for all of you to think and do and process and just try to kind of get some wheels move going, right? Remember, if you have questions or comments, you can throw them in chat or go sign up for one of my training classes. And then you can join office hours and you can ask your question live, right? Maybe your question will drive one of these future videos as well. All right. And with that, I'm going to say thanks and have a great day.